Good morning and welcome to the Chitakubji Baptist Church. This morning we'll be having Ian Gray preaching to us again, as last week. Um, he used to be a part of our church and is now uh, the minister of People's Baptist Church. Um, after the church service at 12 noon, there'll be a remembrance service on our YouTube channel, uh, which has been done jointly with the parish church and the community council. It was suggested that you do a two minute silence on your doorstep and then you can watch the film on our YouTube channel. On the 6th of December, which is the Sunday, we'll be having a church meeting after the service. And we hope many of you can join it, or all of you can join us for, for that. After the service, we'll be having a Zoom chat, as usual, like last week. And we look forward to seeing as many of you as possible at that. Now we pray that God would bless you as you hear the, the word and the challenge of the Grace Sermon. Hi everybody, do you like games? I like games and we've got quite a lot of games in our house. Most of them are from when the children are younger but I've kept hold of them and still play them from time to time so I thought I'd show you a few of our games. This game is called Polar Panic and you take turns to hit the ice blocks and the aim of the game is not to knock the polar bear down, you have to keep him standing. It's a good game. It's not too difficult, very small children can play this game because they like hitting the ice blocks. Next to it, I've got another game that you might recognise called Connect Four. This one's a little bit more difficult because you need to be able to count four in a row and you take it in turns putting in yellow and red counters until somebody gets four in a row. This game, Monopoly, is quite a bit more difficult than the other ones. So there's a lot to it. There's cards, there's money, there's dice, there's all kinds of little squares that you can land on. And it's quite a difficult game to learn how to play it. You can read the instruction book, which is inside it here. And that takes quite a while. And sometimes reading the instructions isn't always very easy either. Or you can get somebody who knows how to play the game and they can teach you how to play. And I think that's much easier if somebody who knows how to do it can show you how to play it <clears throat> and then that's easier for you to learn as well. In church at the minute, we're hearing about the Sermon on the Mount. And that's just a time when Jesus went up a mountain and started talking to the people around about him and explaining things to them. Now the people in those days would have had the Old Testament and that in a way was a bit like having a set of rules. It was quite hard to understand for them and it was quite probably quite a lot to take in and maybe it wasn't the easiest to always work out what you were supposed to do. So Jesus was telling them and showing them a better way to live and he taught them all kinds of things and we've been learning about these in church. He taught them how to handle their anger, how to be kind to other people, how important it is to keep our promises, loving other people, helping other people, he taught us how to pray and also to how to use their money wisely. So, rules can be hard to follow, but Jesus said, Watch what I do, follow me, walk with me and learn from me, and I'll show you a better way to live. And when we look at these stories in the Bible and hear what Jesus has to say, then that's us learning from him. We're not just reading the instructions, we're learning from him as well as to a better way to live following Jesus. God who made us from dust and ashes, breathe, breathe into, into us your breath of life. God who is compassionate, welcome, welcome us with your forgiveness. God who knows our frailty firsthand, lead us through the wilderness of transformation. When our spirits feel dry, Help us to trust in your spirit. Jesus, we, we choose to walk with you. Fasting seems difficult. Prayers seem unanswered. Jesus, we, we choose to walk with you. The world howls like wild animals all around us. Jesus, we choose to walk with you. We can choose to worry or trust you to provide. Jesus, we choose to walk with you. Temptation is everywhere. Doubts can overwhelm us. Jesus, we choose to walk with you. You know what it's like. 
to walk through this desert. Jesus, Jesus we, we choose to walk with you. You long to transform us with wilderness worship. Jesus, Jesus we, we choose, choose to walk with you. With you. Amen. Hello again, Tilly Kutri. We are continuing your series looking at the best sermon ever, the Sermon on the Mount. I had originally been asked to preach on uh, Matthew 5, 21 to 37 as one chunk, but there's such a huge amount in those 16 verses uh, that we had to break it up, which is why you've got to put up with me for four whole weeks. I'm sorry about that. Last week, we were hearing what Jesus had to say about anger and how important it is to recognize and deal with that. Today, we're going to look at what Jesus has to say about adultery and lust. And just by way of a spoiler, Jesus is effectively going to make the same point as he did with anger. You are not going far enough in your understanding of what God requires. Let's read the passage. This is from Matthew 5, verses 27 to 30. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. I want to say right at the beginning that these are some of the hardest words that we find in what Jesus has to say. All the teaching about anger that we were looking at last time is really challenging. And as I said then, Jesus mentioned that first because it's such a huge issue. Nevertheless, this passage covering sexual purity and the next passage that we'll look at next week where Jesus talks about relationships are in some ways, and I think particularly for us in the 21st century, even tougher ones to deal with. So I want to try and explore and deal with this passage as sensitively and as graciously as possible, acknowledging all the struggles and inconsistencies that I bring to it myself, as I'm sure you do too. But I'm very aware that these words, along with the whole of the Sermon on the Mount, are not just theoretical. These are words that cut into people's hearts. They touch our lives very directly. You'll notice in that text, and indeed in the next one, that Jesus is addressing men. Now, it's not to say that this only applies to men, of course, but the idea of a power differ differential between the sexes did not get invented in our day. We sometimes talk about the double standard when it comes to sex. This was actually an explicit part of the law in the ancient world. Uh, let me read you something from an ancient Roman law speaking to men. It goes like this. If you should catch your wife in adultery, you may put her to death without a trial. But if you should commit adultery, she must not presume to lay a finger on you, nor does the law allow it. Now, Jesus does not allow what the Romans did. He actually counters it. Jesus doesn't say what a lot of people then and even today sometimes say. If a man lusts after a woman, maybe it's the woman's fault. Maybe she dressed the wrong way. Maybe she did something. For Jesus, lust is the responsibility of the one who lusts. This idea of looking lustfully that Jesus talks about here is really important. And it's often misunderstood. So let's unpack it for a moment. Our English translations say anyone who looks at a woman lustfully. But the Greek word that Jesus uses is in a form that means whoever looks and goes on looking. In other words, Jesus is not saying that sexual attraction itself is a bad thing. It was God's idea. Sex is very good. God is pro-hormones. 
Our sexuality is part of who we are, whether we're single or married, whether we're young or old. It's a constant source of mystery and wonder and joy whenever we are in life. So Jesus is not talking about attraction or noticing attraction. He's talking about someone who deliberately indulges sexual gratification by continued looking. He's talking about what John Altberg calls the look. You all know about the look. A, a couple is in a restaurant. A woman is waiting on them and the husband finds her sexually attractive. He starts staring at her with a lustful leer. And he's doing that in a way to feed his own desire for sexual gratification. You can see it in his face. The woman waiting at the table knows it and feels awkward or embarrassed or maybe tempted by a certain sense of power it brings. The man's no the wife notices it and feels crushed by it and rejected or angry. If she talks about it, he denies it. So he's adding lying to his sin and, and damages his marriage and dents his integrity. He may think he hasn't violated the seventh commandment yet, but he has stepped out of the kingdom of God. Anyone have any idea what I'm talking about here? Or, or is this all new territory? Let me pause here because sexuality is an area that involves so much emotion, embarrassment, shame, hiddenness, pretending. And one of the things that we see again and again in what Jesus has to say in the Sermon on the Mount is that we have to be a place of radical honesty. We have to step into the light here. So let's do a, a virtual mass confession of sexual fallenness. Lucky you, you get to do this out of uh, sight of the rest of the church. If you have ever committed a sexual sin of any kind, if you've ever looked at something you should not have, if you've ever flirted with the wrong person, if you've ever given the look, if you've ever inappropriately tried to attract the look, if you've ever withheld yourself sexually to hurt your spouse, if you've ever been wounded by feeling unattractive, if you've ever failed to talk to your kids helpfully about sexuality, if you've ever had a single regret, if you've ever felt for a single moment like you could use some help from God about some area of sexuality, if you've ever said the word sex, then just give me a virtual wave. Just to be clear, on the other hand, how many of you have achieved perfection, sexually speaking? I suspect not very many of you are waving now. Now, there is rarely a time these days when sexual ethics are not very much in the news. In our day, generally, in workplaces, in academic settings, in, uh, in the news, what is usually taught is what might be called the ethic of consent. And the goal with that is to teach people to recognise when consent for sexual activity is or is not given and to make sure that they always know they must honour consent. Now, consent is hugely important for a whole raft of reasons, not least theological ones, which we just haven't got time to go into today. But as important as that is, Jesus is talking about something far deeper than the ethic of consent. You might think about it this way. We bring to a relationship three dimensions from our lives, from our kingdom. That is our commitment. Commitment is something we do with our will. Our emotions, our feelings about another person and our bodies. A, a level of commitment, a level of emotional engagement and our physical beings. Those three dimensions should be in balance with each other. That's what the Bible teaches. Sexual intimacy is God's invention to unite two souls. It's the ultimate form of physical intimacy. Marriage 
is the public declaration of permanent and exclusive commitment. It's a promise. So to be sexually intimate with a person to whom I am not married to is to make promises with my body that I withhold in my will. It's just a setup for hurt. It is going to damage a soul. And that's why it's a sin. If you're following Jesus and you are involved in sexual intimacy with a person to whom you are not married, you need to stop. But Jesus is clearly defining goodness in this sexual area uh, as something way deeper than just avoiding sex with somebody I'm not married to. All of us are going to need help to be pure from the inside. How do we get that? Here's where Jesus gets really provocative. This is the stuff that's a real head scratcher for people. Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. Now, does that strike anybody here as just a little tiny bit extreme? He doesn't even say just any old eye. He says your right eye. In the Bible times, the right side of the body was the more valuable and honourable side. Your right eye is your best eye. Then he doesn't say if it's a problem, get an eye patch or gently remove it. He says, gouge it out. Not just that, gouge it out and throw it away. You might have been tempted to keep it in a jar. Till he's full of doctors, maybe you were going to try and get one of them to reinsert it later on. No, go ahead and throw it away. What is Jesus saying here? Some people have taken Jesus literally on this. There was an early Christian named Oregon, or Origen, I'm never sure how to pronounce his name. He wrestled with his sexuality so much, with so much guilt and shame, he actually had himself castrated so that he would not be guilty of sexual sin anymore. That is not what Jesus is recommending. I said last week in the context of his teaching about anger, that Jesus wasn't exaggerating to make a point. But here he is. He is using a technique called hyperbole, which means describing something in almost absurdly extreme ways, which are clearly not meant to be taken literally, but which help us understand both the meaning and the importance of what is being said. Because what Jesus is saying is that true righteousness, true goodness, is not the same as sin avoidance. You might think about it this way. If the goal of God for human beings is just to avoid sinful actions, we could do it through surgery. Cut out your tongue and you will never speak words of deception or harassment. Cut off your hands and you can never use them for violence. Gouge out your eyes and you'll never look at pornography anymore. You'll stop judging people by their looks. Cut off your legs and you won't walk into the wrong places. Cut off your ears and you'll never listen to seductive words or gossip. Should we do that? Perhaps not. The real problem with spiritual growth by elective surgery is that it doesn't work. The real problem is not your eye. It's not your hand. Jesus names it in verse 28. It's your heart. Your heart is the innermost unseen core of your personhood. That's the secret place of my spontaneous thoughts and my desires and perceptions. That's what need, needs to change. That's what God wants to change. If I live for desire, I end up the slave of desire. One other thing, very briefly, I think that Jesus is also saying something else here in this talk of cutting off your hand or your eye, as well as exaggerating to make his point. I think maybe he's also saying this. If you're going to sever something, sever a relationship. Now, I often talk about how vital relationships are, how central they are to God's purposes for our lives. But it is better to sever a relationship with a friend or a colleague than it is to sin. 
If you've got a relationship with someone which is in danger of becoming an inappropriate relationship, one that might get in the way of an existing commitment to a husband or a wife, then it is better to break off the relationship with the friend. That might be very hard to do, but far less damaging and painful than to naively let things develop until suddenly you realise they've gone too far. I remember once hearing another minister talking about this and about how many people had said to him over the years, I never meant to have an affair. I never meant things to go this far. And his message was, if you don't mean to go that far, don't get on that train in the first place. It's better to abandon a friendship and find new ones than to be dragged into sexual promiscuity and adultery. Because we give ourselves an inflated sense of importance and constraint when we feel that we can allow a relationship to develop and develop and develop and still stop it at the right point. Verses 29 and 30 both repeat the phrase, it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now, the word which is translated in most English Bibles as hell is actually the word Gehenna. I'm sure you know the point on the M9 motorway as you drive towards Falkirk, where if you're anything like me, you make sure that your windows are closed and your car air fans are turned off because you drive past the Avonvale, Avondale Waste Recycling Plant. It is a huge landfill site along the side of the motorway with big nets to stop the rubbish blowing onto the road. You know the place I mean. And it stinks. It's absolutely vile. And this word Gehenna was the equivalent of Avondale outside Jerusalem. It was the rubbish dump where all the detritus of life was thrown, all the rubbish from the town. And it constantly burned and smoked and it stank of sulphur. It was a horrible, smelly, dirty place. And Jesus repeatedly uses the phrase, not because he was talking about eternal punishment. That's not what this passage is about. Instead, he's talking about the literal example of this rubbish dump outside Jerusalem. And he's saying, when you trade what God has for you, for the cheapness of what you want as a quick fix, whether that be lust or anything else, it's like throwing your own spirituality, your own identity, your own personhood on the rubbish dump of life. It's like destroying and burning the very best of what you are. So don't do it. I know all that was pretty heavy and it would be a rather negative place to leave this today. So here is the good news. There is freedom. When we come into the light in the area of sexuality, there is freedom. Some of you have been dreading this topic because for years you've been carrying guilt or shame or, or a boatload of regret. There is freedom and grace and healing for anybody who will honestly come to God and step into the light. And so just very briefly as we finish, if this is an area which you are struggling in, and if you are, you're in company with vast numbers of other people, then step one for you is to be honest about it with God. And step two is to talk to someone else about it. Find a trusted brother or sister. If you're a man, find another man. If you're a woman, find another woman. Someone who will hold you accountable. This is such an important area. That in itself will take a significant level of courage and grace for both people. But it is so important. You can try to struggle with sexuality on your own or with just you and God. But eventually you may be humbled enough to realise that you need help. And it's available. And you will still be loved. In a moment, I'm going to pray as we finish. But first, I've got a couple of questions which you might want to chew over with your virtual coffee and cake in the Zoom rooms uh, after this gathering. Question one. The church has been wrapped up in a huge debate over the last few years 
on the subject of same-sex relationships. But the church has, by comparison at least, been remarkably quiet about the issues that Jesus talked about in these verses that we've looked at today. Why do you think that is? Question two. I said that this whole area of sexual purity is a particularly, di particularly difficult one for us in the 21st century that tends to be wrapped up in a lot of shame and regret and hiddenness and embarrassment. Why do you think that is? Are there things as a church that we are doing to make it easier for people to address the issue? Or are there ways in which we are actually making it harder? Let's pray together as we finish. Father, thank you for sex. Thank you for our bodies and our hormones and for beauty and for attraction and most of all for relationships where those things can be exercised. But you know how we struggle with this. You know how easily we mess up your design for our lives, especially in this area. I want us to pray specifically right now for anyone who is feeling really broken or helpless or, or trapped in this respect. Father, would you enable your church to be a place of honesty and wholeness and healing? and acceptance and love. May we speak to one another in grace and in truth. Most of all, Father, would you transform our hearts. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us today and always. Amen.